Flipped, a professional development program for higher degree supervisors and students. Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and welcome to this flipped session on podcasting for PhD students. This is a surprising session, a wonderful session for me to deliver, because as some of you may know, I'm one of the earliest academic podcasters. I've been doing this since 2007. So I taught podcasting, I've taught with podcasting, I've researched it, this is my thing. But it's also a thing that I rarely share more publicly in professional development. I see it as part of a public intellectual role and I use it to enable the career of others. I have the tech, I have the expertise and I'm happy to share it. Podcasting has always been the unpopular runt of the social media litter. It has its fans like me, and we're a very, very tight community. But in the last seven years, podcasting is no longer the runt of the litter. It is popular culture, and you as a scholar, you can't really choose to not be a part of it now. Now, this is all related to the incredible boom created via that podcast serial. But let me talk about why all of this matters first. Now, we are talking about sound, sound only, sonic media. We're not exploring visual media. There's another flip session on that. We're not interested in your face. We're interested in the sound, the soundscape. The reason we're talking about sound and podcasting is that these sonic files can be downloaded and nest. They nestle into your life. You can listen to podcasts while in a commute in the morning, while walking, while exercising. So sound-only media is important because while we're doing something else, we can listen to high-quality content. This capacity to download a sonic file and have it live in a person's life is so important for academics and for academic writers trying to build an author platform. It is an intimate medium. You are whispering in somebody else's ear and they're taking your content on their terms and in their context and they're making it meaningful. There is a certain connection that emerges through sound. And of course, I'm not against the use of video. I've had to deliver video once a week since I've been in these dean roles. So I understand the stress and the advantage and the challenges of video. But I'm talking about a different sort of connection and relationship. Apple a few years ago released their podcast analytics. And they've shown that not only are podcasts part of popular culture... But the people that listen to podcasts are what Miranda Katz has described as advertisers' holy grail. Hyper-engaged and supportive audiences, they stay throughout the show, no matter what the length. Podcast listeners don't want standardisation. They expect experimentation in both form and content. And this is a big audience we're talking about here. Podcast subscriptions on iTunes have expanded beyond 1 billion. And remember, there are 7 billion people on the planet. And the number of unique monthly podcast listeners is 75 million people. Podcasts are gently engaged with on the terms of the listener. Video demands attention, and of course we live in an intention-poor age. Also, podcasts are easier to make than vlogs, and I've got the video thing down because, you know, I've been working with cameras since I was 10, like most Generation Xs, can I say, but I've been working with cameras my whole life. But making high-quality audio is cheaper and it's easier. Also, if you're talking with people on your podcasts, The camera can intimidate. It takes a little while to get everyone to calm down and relax on camera. Now, with a recorder on a desk, we often get better content. With audio, there's much more dexterity with editing. So if you stuff up, you can fix it. So let's talk about you and podcasting. And I'll put in place some definitions, but... I'll be prescriptive about what you need in terms of tech, but obviously there's lots and lots of options available. But if you just want to get into it, get the stuff you need to do that you know it works, that's what I'm going to help you with today. 
So a podcast is audio content. I use vlog or vodcast for video content. So audio digital files that can be downloaded or pushed to a listener. They're available via subscription or syndication. It is a bespoke and customized mode of content. There are millions of podcasts and unlike radio, if you have a specific interest, a really specific interest, there will probably be a podcast on it. So for academics, we can find our deterritorialized audience and it can be a very large one. The word podcast was a portmanteau of iPod and broadcast. Podcasts were and are a disruptive media. Now, I've not listened to radio since podcasts arrive. I choose the audio content that I listen to, and I listen to a lot of it on topics that interest me. It is an individualised media platform. Very small topics can find a very large international audience, which, of course, is great for academics. It's great for PhD students. However small your topic, there will be people around the world who are interested. It's then important, once a podcast is produced, that you tell people about it. So use Facebook, use Twitter X, use LinkedIn, and even Instagram and Pinterest. And what you're doing is you're just creating that literacy, that awareness of your podcast. I'm now going to do the prescriptive bit. There are plenty of options available for you to create a podcast. You can use your phone if you want to. I don't. But if you want the kit that you buy once and you can use for a decade... Here it is. Buy a Zoom microphone. They're a great German company. I've used their microphones for 15 years. The Zoom 2, their entry model, is absolutely fine, really good. The Zoom 4 is even better. If you want the best top of the line, go with Zoom 8, which gives you the gift of a diversity of microphone choices. But like Goldilocks, the Zoom 4 is... Right in the middle is probably just about right. They use SD cards and, of course, the standard conventional AA batteries. Great. So for editing, go to another German firm. Go to Acoustica. They have a software program titled Mixcraft. It is intuitive to use, and so there's nothing really complex that makes you feel like you're running a 747. The tracks are very appropriate for a podcast and a voice, and there's great open access sounds in their library, so you can use it and use those sounds as introductions and conclusions. Great. So we've got great software. I've used it again for 15 years. Absolutely fabulous. I use it most days. As to hosting, again, that's a no-brainer. Go to Libsyn, which stands for Liberated Syndication, www.libsyn.com. So you load your files up to Libsyn, they release them to the world from their interface and automatically populate iTunes. They have a nice little embed code if you've got a website or a LMS, fab option. And that's it. Microphone, editing software, podcatcher. That means all the attention now can be placed on your content. So let's talk about the type of content you can create via a podcast, particularly as a PhD student, as an early career researcher, but obviously it's useful for all of us, all of us, all the time. So here are 10 quick ways to make a decision to use a podcast in your work today. One, when you're delivering a seminar, public lecture or presentation, Record it before the event on a microphone and upload it after your live presentation. Now, this means that your analogue presentation has a digital life beyond its particular time and its particular room. Now, I do record these sessions separately outside of the live gig, and I do that so I can control the quality of the audio. Yes, you can record the questions live and add that at the end of the presentation if you so choose. Two micro interviews. You can ask an expert something and that includes your colleagues and your fellow students, ask them one question and then get an answer. And I call these micro interviews. It can be about defining a concept, talking about a particular method, a key question of the day. But these are not only innovative or quirky, so less than two minutes. They play incredibly well in live lectures, in tutorials, in labs, in seminars. And of course, these short micro interviews enfold really well into learning management systems. Three, 
podcast your PhD journey. This can either involve your supervisor and you, or you can do it on your own. A weekly or a fortnightly podcast talking about what you're doing and how you feel about doing it. You'll get a really loyal audience on the way through, and you'll also start to get incredible help on your thesis. Now, so many of my students have done this. The wonderful Dr. Anne McLeod recorded 58 podcasts during her thesis. But of course, as many of you know, we podcasted through Dr. McWinter's thesis that was particularly important after his death. So he died before the thesis was submitted. We were drafting it and all these podcasts were submitted as part of the examination process to confirm research integrity. Remarkable. And of course, for all our colleagues doing artifact and exegesis theses, you can see how the podcasts can link the two platforms. Four, promote your article. When an article comes out, talk about it. And in the information section of the podcast, do a link to the piece. But these podcasts are great. They provide a context around your research and widens the dissemination and interests in your research. Five, love this one, podcast from the field. For all our crew doing field work, either in the sciences or the social sciences, one way to capture your experiences and reflect on them are podcasts from the field. They let you capture your real-time impressions and provide the basis of later reflections. Six, capture and disseminate high theory and abstract ideas. Sound-only media are ideal to work through really intricate concepts and theories because the concentration is only on sound without the visual distraction. So this means that high-level theoretical conversations are ideally configured through podcasts. And of course, the Open University from the 70s and the 80s on cassettes used sound in this way to teach and share the abstract, the complex, the difficult. Seven, talk through an argument before you write it. Now, can I say my late husband, Steve Redhead, was the absolute master of this, can I say? And we did 12 podcasts around the theme of theoretical times. We tested ideas to see if there was a book there, and I worked him pretty hard. And we recorded one a day over the Christmas break in 2015, 2016, and that meant I loaded one up a day as well. And we received real-time feedback from Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, X. So Steve suddenly realised, my goodness me, this book was a goer. And then, of course, when he came to write the book, he had the podcasts as the scaffold of the monograph. I've never seen anyone do this as effectively before or since. But those podcasts, and can I say they're still in the top 20 podcasts on my podcast every single month for downloads, then went on to sell the book. So the pre-sales of Theoretical Times were high, and one of the reasons was because of the podcasts. Think about it. Eight, interview interesting people and leaders around the world in your field. As you travel around the world and you meet the interesting leaders in your disciplines, ask if they would be part of your podcast. And you'll be amazed how happy people are to talk about themselves, but talk about research and talk with you. These senior people will then, of course, remember you and you gain increased profile for your work and you are sharing high quality content with your audience. Everybody wins. Nine, record a seminar on a key new article or book with your friends, colleagues and fellow PhD students. Every now and again, a big book or article emerges. So get the lab together, get your colleagues together and read the piece and record the discussion or seminar. And of course, that disseminates high quality and interactive content to the world and allows you and your colleagues to work with new ideas. 10. Configure your content for new audiences. At its best, podcasts have a translation function. Whatever your profession, but can I say this is particularly important for health and education, you produce research certainly, but you've got to do a bit more work to connect it to the allied professions. Podcasts are great for this translational work. So here's your article, yay. Here are the results, yay. Now why does that matter to this group of people? Podcasts are great to configure that connection 
build that bridge for you. So there's my 10 genres or mode of content for you. And they're simple, they're straightforward, and they're appropriate for you, whatever discipline and stage of your career you may be in. I really look forward to our conversation. Work out your relationship with podcasting and what can enable your research, your dissemination and your career. Thank you so much for your time. See you soon. 